Oh, oh. Sorry, I brought up, John. Humble apologies, Ollie. Mm -hmm. I just found the error in my system. Mm. I don't know how that happened. Maybe I thought we should have a public holiday to celebrate your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought they got the date a little bit wrong. Mm. Ollie, it's one o'clock, you're on. Ready to go. Yep. Fine. Yeah. Well, um, I'll start by saying good afternoon and uh, Rotarians and guests and welcome to today's meeting. And uh, that'll be more formally done by our president directly. I'm Molly Clark, for those that don't know me, and it's my pleasure to be today's speaker's host. And I'll start by reciting our invocation. <coughs> That's like this. As Rotarians, we offer service to change lives through valuing the fellowship, friendship, and the fun in our Rotary Club. We recognize and acknowledge the diverse backgrounds and needs of uh, our members and of our community in general, of course, and uh, from just from the original inhabitants to of the land chair and the successions of people that follow. Together, we have a we have a collective impact, a very worthwhile impact, I think, from the point of view of the Adelaide Rotary Club. And um, now I think um, it's time for me to please uh, join me in welcoming our presiding officer, who today is our president, Paul Denver. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Ollie. Uh, well, welcome everybody um, to another unique Zoom meeting. Hopefully we won't have too many more of these. We only have one more planned after this week. So we're hoping that on the 16th, I think it is from memory, we will be back at the Oval. I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, our very own Rotarian, David Lewis, and he'll be more formally introduced a little bit later. Um, birthdays. Last week, we had Lawrence Lewis. Now, Lawrence is a name that I, I think only his mother would use when he was in trouble. But uh, Laurie Lewis, 23rd of the 1st. Greg Winston, 23rd of the 1st. Trevor Sterling, 25th of the 1st. Ollie Clark, we wanted it to be the 26th, but it's actually the 28th of the 1st. Sylvia Footner, the 26th. Howard Schultz, the 26th. David Robinson, the 28th. Holmes Umrega, the 28th, and next week we have, or this week coming, Michael Nichols, our new member, on the 30th, well, that's already passed, and Peter Neal on the 4th of the 2nd. So congratulations to all those people on, on their birthdays. Anniversaries, we've had a lot. Sylvia, um, I, I think I saw Sylvia's here today, um, a fantastic number, 23 years. So congratulations, Sylvia. Jeff Tate. Uh, Jeff's had a very sad week. We had the um, uh, uh, Coral's funeral on um, Monday. Uh, it was very well attended and it was a lovely service. Uh, Jeff Tate, uh, been a member with us for 46 years. Diane Wilkins, um, 24 years. Ian Renton, 20 years. Myself, 14 years, so I'm a, a newbie. Florian Pleckel, um, four, four years. And we have Byron Gregory coming out nine years, Paul Bartley nine years, and Peter Mullinger three years. Um, health updates. I don't really have any health updates, but I do have the news. You would have seen it. Um, we've had two um, uh, people uh, pass away this week. So we've had um, Jeff Tate's wife, Coral, and then a couple of days later we had... Um, uh, Roy Scraggs' wife, Joy, passed away. Um, Roy actually attended Jeff Tate's funeral, which was the day after Joy had died as well. So we got to say our condolences to him there. Um, please remember to check the bulletin, Facebook and WhatsApp for any messages. They are our main forms of communication these days. And uh, I invite you to contribute to the community projects um, by placing most uh, donations in the online uh, bowl link in the bulletin. Um, it's a really easy thing to do. I've done that and I've set it up so that it's just a regular weekly payment that comes out. And so that I don't have to remember. And uh, for me, that's a good thing. 
Okay, now I would like to hand over to our host for the Spotlight on Service. And today it will be Ollie Clark. Thank you. No, there's a bit of confusion, isn't there? Sorry. <laughs> I've just seen that I've got the note. I've been following um, um, the notes that were sent through, but I realised they're the wrong ones. Juliano, I need to hand over to you now first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. If you, if you can't, Paul, let me know. Yep. Yeah, I can hear you. I'm all good. Okay. So today Juliana, I'm talking about the community points, grant Juliana. program that we're going to be running this year. So as most of us hopefully will recall, uh, an MOU was set up by the, our club and our charitable trust fund. Um, and that was signed last year so that that establishes the uh, community grants program. Why? So that we can, as a club, help the trust distribute the minimum annual capital requirement, which is normally around $50,000. So, and often the uh, that grant itself, we, we break into two or three different organisations um, and track them through. And that's what happened last year. We distributed uh, to three different organisations. By the way, those three organisations are going to be presenting next week, right? So they're our speakers next week. That's all, what's on the agenda. If everything still works okay, those three organisations will present next week. So why am I talking about the Community Grants Program yeah, no. right well, now? It's uh, not because next week. we're about it's to on. start the next round of our program um, and we're going to be seeking applications and then going through the process. So I'd just like to explain the process of what's going to happen. We have a committee uh, which is, uh, is structured, well, which I have to run. It's my responsibility as a Vice President of Community Services, as it will pass on to Zing next, next uh, uh, year as such, or the next Rotary year, uh, who will take on a similar role. It just follows the VP. We chair the committee. Uh, the Community Grants Program Committee. And on that committee are, are both the two Vice Presidents, Community Services, uh, this year and next year, uh, the Presidents this year and next year, if they want to be there, um, the Community Service Directors this year and next year, and of course a representative from our trust, our trust, our charitable trust fund, which will soon be a foundation, we hope. Um, so that committee is the core committee. And what we ask is if we can have a couple of members volunteer. So I need some people to put their hands up. I know Frank and oh, I forgot who else, but a few people, I think four people volunteered uh, last year uh, to help us shortlist with the selection committee shortlisting process of the grant applications. Grant applications will open in March, start of March, and will be open for all of March. Okay? And they will close at the end of, end of March, I imagine. And during April is when the selection committee will shortlist the applications. Um, once they're shortlisted, we will hopefully, and, and this process still hasn't been clearly defined yet, but I'm expecting that we'll do some presentation to our club uh, via the Spotlight on Service or whatever, um, so that our members can understand who are shortlisted and provide some feedback to the committee or to the board or to whatever, but provide some feedback. That feedback itself will probably be via a form on our website. Uh, it's, it's probably the easiest way where we just go on our website, uh, click a few boxes saying, I like this one, I like that one. There'll be a summary or proxy of the applications as well. So our members can then just help us. So every one of our members will be able to get input into which uh, recipients of uh, the grant will get the money as such. Um, in the end, the board will approve. It's not up to the committee or the members, in fact, who gets the money. The board needs to approve it. So there'll be a bunch of rigour around the process that the board will make sure we have appropriate governance of where the money goes, as happened last year. Okay. Um, so please contact me if you want to participate uh, and help in that committee and the selection committee. Um, the actual grant itself, or the, 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 program, uh, the project itself, probably won't be awarded until July this year, because we're preparing for the distribution of the 
funds which will be defined as of July 20, July, uh, July 2022. Um, please also, there's one more thing I want to encourage, and all of us have associations with uh, organisations. And if you are passionate about that organisation, please help them uh, submit to this grants program. Put your name up and say, hey, I, um, I'm happy to help you as well. Put your name on the application so that we know they've got member support, multiple members involved, put multiple members' uh, names on those applications, uh, because that's important to support the organisations that our members want to support. Thank you for the time today. Sorry, Paul, I hope I haven't taken too long, but that's a quick pricing of the uh, Community Grants Program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Juliana. Um, so just to let you know, it's not next week that we have the presentation from the uh, people who have received the grants. It's the following week. It's on the 16th, and that's uh, when we hope to be back at the Oval. And that's part of really why we want to be back at the Oval, because there'll be three speakers on that day talking about how they received their grants. Now, I was going to make an announcement a little bit earlier, but I wanted to wait for a few more people to arrive, so I can do that now. Um, I would like to, on behalf of our club, uh, officially congratulate Stephen Haynes for being named in the Australia Day Honours. Um, I must apologise, there was a little bit of confusion there. I had him down as an AC, but he's actually an AM. Um, so, Stephen, congratulations. Uh, what a wonderful award and uh, very well deserved, I'm sure. So, a round of applause, everybody. Thank you, thank you, Paul. And uh, I didn't. I was. Uh, I, I understand the promotion to AC, but I'm not quite ready for that yet. So thanks very much. Okay. Well, you're on the path. <laughs> very good. All right. Now I would like to try again and hand over to Ollie Clark, who will Paul, introduce Paul, us. One, sec one second, Paul. Uh, there's a message from Jeff Miller that there are three members already on the committee. And he feels that it has to be the members should continue for three years. So that's something for Giuliano to uh, take it under his hat and discuss. Okay, you heard that, Giuliano? Giuliano is frozen. Okay, yeah, we'll yes, follow I that. that. That's fine. Right. Um, we'll follow that up with Giuliano. Okay, so I, 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 sorry, sorry, Paul. Once no, Roy's I'll leave it to you, Rajesh. No, no, no Ro, Ro, Roy's Craig is here. If you want to acknowledge Jason. Ah, yeah, Roy. Yeah. Okay, I didn't see his photo there. Um, just look. Ah, oh, there is, I can see Roy now. Um, so, Roy, on behalf of the club and and myself, we would like to offer our sincere condolences on the passing of Joy. Um, I know a few of us got to see you on Monday at um, Coral's funeral, um, but uh, to let you know that uh, our thoughts and, and prayers are very much with you. Okay. Thanks, Roy. Okay, we'll move on then to um, try again, Olive, um, to have you as the to introduce our speaker for today. Over to you, Olive. Thank you very much. Paul. Thank you very much. And it's a great challenge, and yes, it's a great pleasure and a privilege for me to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor David Lewis. He's the member of our club, of course, and head of the School of Chemical Engineering and Advanced Materials. And I can't emphasise the importance of that little addition enough. It's tremendous, very important. Now, a little bit about David, um, and I don't want to take a lot of time because he's got plenty of things to tell us. But um, I hope um, I'm right here, David, but I think you were a about a two pound pom, weren't you? You came over when you were very, very young and uh, you lived down Christie's Beach Way and then you, <laughs> made a big choice in your teens and joined the Navy and did an apprenticeship there in electrical fitting, et cetera, and become a tradesman. And then you moved out to uh, private and public um, organizations and amongst them Sage International, which was a very, very high technology company and still is, and um, went about life. So there are a few uh, things that, that really are the need to be said as well. I've had the, uh, the privilege of working with David uh, for several 
years now in several ventures, more nearly two decades. Most recently, um, when we, <laughs> David was kind enough to accept the role as the chair of the club's statewide science and engineering challenge. I can't thank him enough for taking on that role. And of course, he's done a marvelous job in these couple of challenging couple of years already. But uh, in years past, we've uh, worked together on several projects, but particularly the production of uh, environmentally friendly fuels and energy issues generally, energy technologies, starting with a seawater to algae to liquid fuel plant, pilot plant up at a little place called Caratha up in Western Australia. We visited that routinely, but then it developed into a demonstration size plant at Wyala. He uh, was a guest speaker globally on algae growth and harvesting and uh, conversions, and he still is. He's a consultant in that area still globally. I remember a project um, undertaken for a Japanese a cosmetic company during our time at Wyala, and that was to replace palm oil with uh, a special algae strain as the prime ingredient as they were keen about. That Japanese company was keen about being environmentally friendly as well. Now I have the privilege, I had the privilege of accompanying David on several trips, uh, especially to the United States. Always educational, always enjoyable. We attended the last one, I think, was a huge um, complex. It was about energy matters generally, and it was in um, uh, New Orleans. And uh, they told us that there's a venue there is the biggest in America, as well as the one in Chicago. So it was a hell of a big show, and we had a very, very enjoyable time. But uh, David, I don't know about you, but the bit that I remember vividly is wandering down Bourbon Street about three o'clock in the morning and bumping into a jazz club. A lot of fun. But we did learn a lot at the uh, at the meeting as well, and it was after it had finished. So um, I think um, I could speak, as I mentioned before, hours about Dave and what he's done. But ladies and gentlemen, let's get on with it. Time for there will be time for questions later. David, you're on. Thank you very much, Ollie, for that kind introduction, and thank you, fellow Rotarians, for having me speak to you. I'll just share my screen and now, uh, oops, I think I've just shared the wrong PowerPoint. Let me try that again. Okay, so hopefully you can see the microchips and potato chips um, presentation. Okay, great. So th thanks very much for having me uh, speak with you. Um, as Ollie said, I'm, I'm currently the head of school of chemical engineering and advanced materials at the University of Adelaide. I've had the honor to have that role since 2018. Um, it's a terrific privilege to be a head of school at the University of Adelaide. And it's very much like running a small business. So I thought what would be most useful for this group is for me to share with you a little bit about the school, what we do, a bit about the university, a bit about the students, and then focus on microchips and potato chips, but probably more of the focus on microchips. So, okay, sorry about this. Okay, so yeah. My talk will cover a bit about the university, the school, and really the future of chemical engineering as I see it. So two areas that I think that chemical engineers are going to play a massive role, which is relevant globally and definitely relevant nationally, is in quantum materials and food and beverage. These are areas of enormous potential for job creation, new industries, uh, and we need to train our youth to work in these sectors. So on this slide, there's a couple of pictures. I have a picture of the space station. So David, can you make your uh, presentation full screen, please? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. Thanks for... Um, yeah, go on to the full... Yeah, that one. Yep, yep. Is that full screen? Uh, not yet. I'm not sure which one I'm looking at. 
click click on that and then let's see if it works full screen okay are you do you see my speaker notes what's no yeah, we've got we've got all the slides down the left hand side oh yeah. okay, that one yeah yeah okay that's strange because it's showing go to slideshow david yeah no no no, no. it is i've got three screens here you go up to the slide <laughs> up to slideshow at the top slideshow yep might have to share that particular screen yeah i think you're right then you, what you have to do is get out and come back on again because it won't recognize the changes. Yes. Zoom. You need to get out of sharing your screen, come back again with okay. the new setup. Yeah, with the new yep. screen. Yep. Gotcha. So what I might, yep. So, okay. Sorry about this. Sorry. Um, so, why? 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 Okay. So, okay. How's that? Is that the full yep. screen? Yep, that's good. Yep, that's it. Yep. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, so on this picture, we have um, the space station. And below that is a the University of Adelaide logo. So last year our researchers actually actually got a, an experiment in the space station. So that was a great marketing for the University of Adelaide. And the experiment was really looking at neurofin, so Panadol, um, and see how stable this particular drug is in zero gravity. So it was a simple experiment, but massive impact by having the um, experiment on the space station. And I thought below that is the Canadian space agency where they've let loose a whole bag of chips under zero gravity. And I thought that was quite a nice link to my talk. And I wondered why they would do that. And apparently they, um, they wanted to replicate Homer Simpson. So apparently on one of the <laughs> Simpson shows, he was on the space station eating chips. So that's a nice link to the talk. Okay, so a bit about the University of Adelaide. So uh, many of you probably are familiar with our university, um, but we're essentially a $1 billion business. So we're part of the group of eight and we turn over around a billion dollars a year. Now that sounds huge. The top five of the group of eight are probably two to $3 billion businesses. So they are very, very large uh, universities, but we're not doing too badly. All of us, of course, were impacted severely by COVID, uh, predominantly because we couldn't get international students on shore. And we have seen a massive drop off in enrollments, which equates to dollars. But the University of Adelaide is going not too bad. Um, there's some data here just to show you about the scale of the university. <laughs> So this is 2020 data. We don't have the 2021 data yet, but I do know it was quite similar. So we had around 23,000 students and 50-50 gender balance, basically. So 45 girls. We have a very good staff student ratio, about 21 to 1. And we have students from all around the world. So when COVID occurred, we, because it really didn't start in Australia around March 2020, we already had a lot of international students on shore. So most of those stayed here. Um, so that was good. But we had new students who enrolled online. So we've had lots of students now who have not actually been on campus and are now starting their uh, second year of study. So that's quite strange. Uh, we hope that they will come back this semester. Um, but we're still expected to teach online to those students who may still be stuck overseas. So it's been a very interesting time for universities, but we are doing okay. Um, so don't believe everything you hear in the press. It's not as bad as people may, may think. So the University of Adelaide is very um, successful with its uh, rankings globally. So we do rank quite highly around the world. Uh, and when you think there's probably 30 or 40,000 universities globally were definitely in the top um, 200. 
uh, have been in the top 100. And in many of our discipline areas, as you will see later, we are in the top 50 globally in certain disciplines. So we're a very impactful university and very important to the state of South Australia. Uh, discipline rankings. So this just shows you where our various engineering disciplines are ranked globally. Uh, chemical engineering, we are, um, with this particular league table, we're in the 50 to 100 band, which is very good for us. Um, when I started as head of school in 2018, we're in the 200 to 300 band. So one of the, our strategies is to become a top 50 chemical engineering school, and we're almost there. So the core disciplines, electrical, mechanical, civil, and chemical, are all doing very well in the global rankings, as are the other more specialized engineering disciplines. So this is very important for the university because this is one of the attractors of, uh, for international students to come and study with us. So for example, Saudi Aramco, the big oil company in Saudi Arabia, will send the top students in Saudi Arabia to um, schools that are ranked in the top 50. So they will pay their students to study globally, but you have to be ranked top 50. So these tables are very important to get the best students. So we always focus on how we're performing and the rankings are based on our research activities, the student experience, uh, uh, the employment of our graduates. So many, many different factors. Um, we do very, very well in the research um, metrics and we're trying to improve the student experience at the University of Adelaide to try and improve our rankings. That's very difficult. In our school, we um, have a range of chemical engineering programs that are accredited by the Institute of Chemical Engineers based in the UK and Engineers Australia. Having these accreditations is very important. So our engineering uh, graduates, their discipline um, degree is recognized globally. So our chemical engineers can work anywhere in the world and be recognized, their qualifications are recognized. So we do have um, quite a bit of work to maintain accreditation to meet a certain level as, as by the Washington Accord to train our engineers to the high level. We've learned over the last couple of years that we need to provide some specialist programs. Um, one thing we did was change the name of the school to Chemical Engineering and Advanced Materials. The reason for that was all of our expertise in advanced materials. So this is a huge growth area and the areas we work, and this will become a bit more apparent in a few slides, uh, is uh, renewable energy, so new batteries, uh, catalysis, and more recently, semiconductors. So we have offered a Master of Materials Engineering which is targeted both uh, locally and internationally. And the other program that we've developed in the past two years is the biopharmaceutical engineering um, program. That's a deliberate play on the international market. Our pharma industry in Australia is not that big. And one of the positives, if there could be of COVID is that it has put a focus on, we need some sovereign capability in producing vaccines. So we're hoping we'll see more interest in the pharmaceutical industry developing further in Australia, and then we can provide the, uh, the graduates to that sector. Okay. So I always tell my students that uh, chemical engineers cause climate change with the industrial revolution. So chemical engineers need to fix it. So there is obviously a big focus in our programs now about addressing uh, pollution, which leads to climate change and chemical engineers do play a significant role in this. So we are front and center at many of these uh, international meetings now that are starting to address the issues around climate change. And essentially our graduates need to improve the processes that produce the products for our everyday lives. So we need to use less resources. We need to use those resources more efficiently, and we need to find better ways of doing things. 
So some obvious areas of transportation. So as you know, there's a big focus on electric vehicles. There are limitations with those vehicles. Something I'm interested in is um, biofuel, so heavy transportation fuels. That's a big problem. So Australia runs on diesel. So without diesel, uh, we couldn't operate. If you think of all the trains and trucks that uh, move our goods across the country, so we use a lot of diesel. So what are we going to replace diesel with? This is the big problem. So there's big challenges ahead in every area you can imagine about becoming more sustainable. So in our programs, we're trying to now incorporate a lot more focus on sustainable engineering and better ways of using our resources. A big focus on the circular economy. So recycling, producing less waste. Waste is a resource, we need, need to use our waste better. So that is a strong focus that we are trying to impart on our students. So one of the growth areas that we are focusing, focusing on for new jobs and opportunities, manufacturing. I think COVID's really highlighted in Australia that we are quite vulnerable economically because we rely on most of our goods to be manufactured overseas. So that's fine when our borders are open and goods can come in readily, but when borders close, it causes a big problem. So the uh, Australian government has some national manufacturing priorities. Uh, there's six of them, they're listed here. So resources, food and beverage, medical, recycling, defense and space. So chemical engineers traditionally play a part in all of those areas, but areas where we've probably been less impactful in Australia is the food and beverage sector and defense space, which sort of leads me to my talk around micro trips and potato chips. So there's a nice picture here of um, Joe Biden waving a wafer in the air. So this big disc in his hand is the uh, a silicon wafer, which is the first part of producing a semiconductor. So this is a, a very important piece of infrastructure, as Joe called it, because it's integral to our life. So without nowadays, without semiconductors, uh, we can't do many things. So one of the problems we've got, and US, you would have heard this in the press, is that all the interest of China taking back Taiwan. So why, why is that? So one of the big industries in Taiwan is the semiconductor industry. And there's one company, the, the Taiwan Semiconductor industry, uh, Company, that produces most of the world's semiconductors. So their turnover for quarter one last year was $346 billion. This is owned by a single person and provides semiconductors to companies like Tesla, Apple, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a huge opportunity for the US, but it's also an opportunity for Australia. Um, one of the issues in Australia is we don't have any sovereign capability around producing semiconductors, but we rely on them. We need them in all of our communication, in our mode of uh, transportation. Uh, they play a big part in defense. And by not having sovereign capability with the manufacture of semiconductors, we're very vulnerable. So that is an area that we've started to establish at the University of Adelaide is training people in broadly quantum materials, in particular semiconductors. So in their design and then their manufacture. So I'll talk more about that. Um, and the last picture there shows uh, the production of potato chips. Um, and I was quite taken that the, the type of uh, PPE that the people wear in those industries, the semiconductors and potato chips, is the same. These are very clean environments. And I'll talk a bit more about their production a bit later. And finally, on this slide, I just found a really nice quote from Elon Musk last year that's very pertinent to chemical engineers. So manufacturing is underrated and design is overrated. Developing a production system is 10 to 100 times harder than designing the product. 
That is so true. So Elon said that because of the difficulties he, he had in establishing Tesla. But it's quite easy to come up with a design of a new product. But when you need to produce millions of them, it becomes very, very challenging. So this is an area where chemical engineers play a significant role as process engineers. So we develop processes to mass produce products. So we take raw materials to products. So they might be potato chips, they might be sem semiconductors. So we train our students how to design and optimize and operate processes. So we really want our students to start thinking about manufacturing opportunities in, in Australia and in particular South Australia. What are the new industries of the future that are going to help our economies, economy and create jobs? So microchips. So why are we interested in microchips? So a couple of years ago, when I took the role as the head of school, we had a company turn on our doorstep called Solana. So Solana are one of these companies no one's ever heard of, but they are very successful. So everybody who has an iPhone has a Solana product in it. So they make one of the radio antenna semiconductor devices in the iPhone. So they are an Australian owned company um, by a single person, very, very successful. And they've developed several semiconductor products over the last few years that have uh, uh, distributed globally. Their production facility is in the US. They've now established a production facility in Brisbane, producing uh, high efficiency LEDs for disinfection. So COVID happened at a perfect time for them. They've just invented this very efficient diode, LED, light emitting diode, that's used for disinfection of surfaces. Um, so the company Tetra Pak wanted a very efficient way of sterilizing all of their product. And they are now using the Solana LEDs. So they are now being mass produced at the old Boeing facility in Brisbane. So Solana turned up here because they want to develop the next product. And fortunately, the chief scientist with Solana graduated from our physics school many years ago and wanted to return to Adelaide. So, and he realized that if we are to have a semiconductor industry established in Australia, indeed South Australia, we need process engineers to operate that um, facility. So that's why semiconductors. Having Sanana here has attracted the uh, Defence Force to us. So they are very interested in semiconductors for defence applications, in particular high powered lasers. So that's the photo on the on the side of the bottom photo. So Defence want to develop lasers to take out missiles in the sky. And they're actually on campus now developing that new technology. Uh, the middle picture here is a lab on a chip. So that's something else which is also related to semiconductors, nanofabrication, is producing these devices where we can do uh, analysis on very on chips. So it's very cheap and easy. Um, and there's a lot of focus on lab on chips in the in the pharmaceutical sector. And the picture above is a of one of these. Um, sterilization diodes. And the last picture on this slide is the new laboratory, which is directly below my office. Um, it's a quantum fabrication laboratory. It looks like that picture was given to us uh, yesterday, the builder handed it over. And this is now going to enable us to manufacture semiconductors at lab scale to train students how to do that. So it's a uh, very exciting. So with the microchip manufacturer, I'll go through that a little bit. Um, so it really starts with modeling. So you design your chip uh, and then you produce the chip. So in the middle picture there, you see a reactor, it's called a molecular beam epitaxy, MBE. Uh, we have two of them downstairs. They cost about $20 million each and they're basically a vacuum chamber. So if you imagine the pressure between halfway between planet Earth and the moon. That's sort of the same pressure inside that reactor. 
where we can vaporize metals and place individual atoms on a silica disk atom by atom exactly where we want them so the chip or the wafer you see on, on the other side is produced layer by atomic layer by atomic layer so a nice analogy if you imagine a, a, an eight ball table a snooker table and you pour all the balls on the snooker table and they randomly spread anywhere with these machines we can put those balls exactly where we want them so it's amazing technology so i know when i did chemistry at high school my chemistry teacher said that he couldn't show me an atom but nowadays we can manipulate atoms so it's incredible so we have this capability now in the school so we're producing the wafers so the wafer is that disc that joe biden was flying around um, that is um, using different metals to give the uh, material different properties that you can exploit in a, an application so once you have that wafer you then have to process it into a device so the new lab we're building downstairs will enable us to take the wafer which we can produce but now produce the device so this has been a huge investment by defense force the university and solana tens of millions of dollars over the last two years but it's now given us capability to produce um, devices, new devices. So Defence are funding a new $35 million uh, project downstairs on producing a, a device that I can't really go into, but nevertheless, it's a semiconductor device. So it's a very exciting uh, development for the University of Adelaide, but a great opportunity for chemical engineering because like <coughs> Elon Musk says, it's easy to, to produce one device. Now you've got to mass produce them. So we need to train our graduates how to work in these types of industries that are very complex. So mass production is very uh, resource intensive. And this slide here is just some small data around a life cycle assessment. So the one of, one of the things we do as chemical engineers is look at the whole life cycle of a product and understand, so we say from cradle to grave, what resources we use over that whole life cycle. Um, and you can imagine it's a very complex analysis, but very insightful um, and quite scary too when you start assessing the carbon footprint of the products we take for granted. They're huge. So silicon chips use a lot of water. So the thick black line at the top of the graph here is the use. So this is the total water use per dye. So a dye is one component on that big wafer. So a dye would become a semiconductor. So we use about 10,000 liters of water for one dye. So you imagine one LED requires 10,000 liters of water for it to be produced. So you can see it's an unsustainable industry. Now, a lot of that water, as you can see in the data, is associated with other aspects, so electricity production, that's a huge component, um, the supply of the chemicals, etc. But the actual fabrication still requires a lot of water, and that water needs to be ultra pure. So this is an expensive business to get into, but it's a great opportunity for process engineers where we can start trying to um, innovate and work at how we can use less resources to produce these products. A lot of the chemicals used in the manufacture of semiconductors are very toxic, and we need to use green chemicals, so more environmentally friendly chemicals. So these are the areas we're trying to train our students uh, to be, uh, enable them to become more knowledgeable and get specialized in this industry. So potato chips. So, Another important industry uh, in South Australia is the food and beverage sector. So this is a huge opportunity for us. You would have heard this before from our politicians that we need to be expecting exporting quality foods around the world. So a lot of these foodstuffs need to be processed. And once again, we need chemical engineers designing those processes for those foodstuffs. So one area we're looking at at the moment is the wine sector. 
So you can imagine there's a lot of stainless steel in wineries that's only used for a few months a year when they produce the wine. So all of that stainless steel is dormant for many months a year. So could that be used for other products? So we're working with the wineries to look at other fermentation products that could be produced in their infrastructure out of season of producing wine. <clears throat> and that's just one small example of where we're looking for some innovation in, <clears throat> excuse me, the food and beverage sector. So, <clears throat> thank you, Pam. <clears throat> On the graduate program, we've now introduced uh, some majors, so coursework for semiconductors. So our students get to learn about those processes, uh, which is very complex, and also food and beverage. <clears throat> so we did the obvious, we introduced a brewing course. And how popular is that? Students love making beer. So we've got lots and lots of students making fantastic ranges of beer now. And hopefully this year will be, our students will make beer that will be sold at the uni bar. So it's, it's a great outreach activity, but they're learning about how to work in the food industry. So obviously making foodstuffs has all sorts of regulations that you wouldn't find in a traditional process such as paint making or paper and pulp mills or something. So it's a, a great opportunity for us. So once again, we can look at the whole process of making potato chips. It's not straightforward. Um, I'm not an expert of making potato chips, but I do know that the, the cooking process is altered depending on the flavor chip that they want to produce. So there's lots of know-how in making potato chips. Um, Smith's Chips uh, in Adelaide, that's owned by PepsiCo. A lot of our graduates work there. But I looked at the life cycle assessment of potato chips and they also use lots and lots of water. So I've put on the slide a, a small picture of potato chip bags on those C and D categories. So we use 50 or greater than 500 liters um, per kilogram of, of water per kilogram of chips produced. So once again, a resource intense industry. Uh, and I think all of us underestimate how much water we use to produce the products we take for granted. So this is a great graph showing you the ranges of water usage, depending on the product. And I was very pleased to see that beer has quite a low water usage. So that's a good thing. But more processed products and meat uses enormous amounts of water. Same for carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, so carbon footprint of different food products is very high, depending on how much processing that product has. And once again, the potato chips have quite a high carbon footprint. So interestingly, there's quite a few analogies between potato chips and microchips, but these are areas of opportunity for South Australia to develop new industries. We are working with Defence. I had a meeting with them yesterday about developing sovereign capability of producing semiconductors in South Australia for the Defence Force. So you, you may hear one day about Concept One, which is a new fabrication facility at Adelaide Airport. Uh, that we're trying to get funded for that exact purpose. So we have defense are very interested. Um, but with a, a federal election coming up, it might go quiet for a little while, but we'll see how that goes. So I'd just like to wrap up. So it's incumbent upon us at the University of Adelaide to empower our students. They are the future of South Australia. Uh, we're trying to modify and update our coursework across the university. So it's more relevant for what society needs. We want our students to graduate, create their own jobs. Gone are the days where they work for big firms, they need to go and start their own and create their own opportunities, employ their own people. Um, so it's, it's quite a shift, but we see a lot of enthusiasm from the youth. And that's probably the best thing about my job is working with young people. The picture here is um, last year we had a student staff cricket match in chemical engineering. Uh, I found the old trophy. It's not a clear picture, but the last time the school and students had a match was 1969. Um, and the trophy had collected dust for all those years. 
So after 20 or so years, we more sorry, um, we um, had another staff cricket match. So that was great. But what I like you to look at in the picture is how many girls there are. So in chemical engineering, we're very fortunate that we have an equal number of boys and girls doing our degree programs. So it's one of the few engineering disciplines that seems to attract a good number of girls, um, which is really important. They make great chemical engineers. Um, so that's going well. So we need to establish new industries. I've mentioned sovereign capability in semiconductors. And obviously food and beverage is a great sector that's full of opportunity. Um, but once again, we need to train the people to work in that sector. And the last thing I would like to say is what is happening at the University of Adelaide at the moment happened in Stanford. So we all know about Silicon Valley and how amazing that uh, activity was that led to a trillion dollar business, uh, businesses you know, developing. That was a fortuitous meeting of defense and universities around radar, which led to semiconductors. So we've got the same thing happening. History is repeating Adelaide at the moment. So defense are investing heavily tens of millions of dollars into the University of Adelaide on semiconductor manufacture and development. This will definitely attract startups. And I encourage you to watch that video because I think you might be seeing history repeating itself in Adelaide very soon. So thanks for listening. Hopefully some of what I said made sense. Um, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. I think it's over to me again, but I'm going to introduce Rajiv, who's going to uh, ask whether there are any questions out there. Yeah, we have about 10 minutes time, Molly. And David, if you are happy to take questions, let's uh, open it up to the floor. Absolutely. Thank you. Have I stopped sharing my screen? Yeah, I've stopped it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. David Maltram has got a question. Yep. David, you're on mute, David. You need to unmute yourself, David. Sorry. Yep. yep. David, uh, thank you very much. You talked about uh, the, the use of water and how, how much water is used. Uh, can this is it then go into waste, or can it be recycled, or is it just used and gone? So thanks, David, for the question. So about can the water be recycled? So absolutely, it can be. So. Uh, unexpectedly, it's um, all about dollars and cents. So when you've got cheap water, companies don't recycle. So if there's an economic imperative on them to recycle the water because it's cheaper than, than use fresh water, they will recycle. But recycling water is not cheap because you, you have to feed the water. So definitely in the semiconductor industry, they have their own water treatment plants um, where they get ultra pure water. So they do recycle. Um, Smith's chips um, in Adelaide uh, have invested a lot in their water uh, treatment process. So more and more companies are definitely doing recycling. Jeff Miller has a question. Uh, can you hear me, David? Yes. Ah, oh, brilliant. Um, so thank you. That was, I really enjoyed your, your talk today. Um, really interesting. Um, <clears throat> what I was interested in was the, <clears throat> the intersection between uh, international students and then clearly uh, sensitive um, projects with defence involved. Is there a conflict there? How do you deal with, say, a PhD student from China who's learning all the secrets uh, that defence are paying for for this country? Yeah? You know, is, is, do you have issues there? So, so good question. So the question was around, you know, non-Australian citizens working on defence projects. Yeah. It's a problem. It's a problem. So defence have a, a well, have a well-established security system. And there are levels that only certain people can access in their, in their structure. And certain facilities that you can only access if you have a certain clearance. 
So that's the way they manage the research. So there's some labs on site now that are unaccessible and only Australian citizens can be employed or be a student to get in that facility. There's other levels like downstairs is zone two at the moment that international students can be part of. But the laboratory has been built so we can quarantine space that becomes classified. So it is a problem. Um, so there will be, as, as we get more projects from defence, we will only be able to take Australian citizens into those programs. So, so it's something that we'll have to manage. Yeah. Uh, and just to part B to that, so if I'm a student, say, uh, an Australian citizen, and I'm working on one of those projects, do I have to sign sort of non-disclosure or security, um, you know, yes. statements? Yep. Like, to yes. To stop me talking about it down in the refectory to other, other people? Yes, you do. So, <laughs> so, so definitely. So students are signing um, uh, contracts with defence, with the university, NDAs, um, all different levels. So yes. So, so yeah, but that that all those procedures had to be put in place a few years ago before defence actually would come on site. Right. Yeah. So, so it's manageable. Um, but what we're seeing is what I was trying to allude to is by having defence here with heavy investment. Sure. It's attracting other, other things. Yeah. Things, yeah. That's right. Other opportunities for those other students. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Great David. Pa Paul had a question and then Stephen Noble after Paul. Um, I think mine's been answered. It was about um, how companies like Defence engage with you. Do they, uh, is it just like a contract arrangement where they pay for your service and you're the research arm? Yes. So, so we have a, a commercialisation and innovation division and they manage contracts basically so we we have all sorts of arrangements with companies and government institutions that uh, are all agreed on before the work starts so it's pay for service it's secret it's confidential yeah there's ip agreements so it's a case by case yep thank you thanks david stephen noble yeah uh, david that was an excellent presentation very very interesting thank you. i've just got, got a query it's a it sort of fits into the chem engineering space, I believe. But it's actually around environment as well. I, I read an article quite recently that said in Australia, we actually only truly reuse or recycle 4% of all the plastics we consume, which I think is terrible. Um, and I think of, of many others would probably agree, particularly if they're married to someone like my wife, who is a fastidious recycler. But it's, um, I don't know if you've got any comment about that, but I, I was just appalled, but... In this article, it referred to the, the fact that in the US, which has become a major producer of, uh, of oils and derivatives, um, that as many, many years ago, decades ago, they decided that their objective was not to sell plastics to the household. It was to sell plastics through the household into the rubbish bin. And that's what we've been seeing for decades. Yep. Got any thoughts or comments about that? No, well, I, I do. Sorry, yes. So... Um... Definitely, we overuse post plastics. Um, definitely, we don't recycle them. Uh, the incentives aren't there, economic incentives to recycle. All plastics are recyclable, but some are much more difficult to recycle than others. And one of the issues with recycling plastics is that they're all quite different in their composition. And it's how do you separate them? So there's definitely some R&D underway in our school, looking at technologies that are ubiquitous so they'll take any plastic and it's basically to convert it back to a plastic feedstock um, but we really need to try and use less plastics because it's not sustainable it, that they derive from fossil fuels which we don't want to be using much of for as long you know for much longer um, a huge problem and as you know it's all the other issues once they go to the landfill they enter the ecosystem microplastics in our fish you know humans are starting to consume plastic unknowingly so it's a huge huge problem yeah. thanks david so we, we are at the end of the session um, monica quick question if you want because you are the host co-host so you can ask the question i think and then off to paul 
very quick question. What sort of batteries are you developing and for what application? Okay, so what, what our team's working on is uh, zinc manganese batteries. Uh, they're trying to work on using water as electrolytes. Uh, the, the issue with batteries is the size and energy density. So they're trying to develop new batteries that has the same energy density and size as lithium batteries. So they'll be safer, they won't self-combust, um, and be more sustainable. So one of the issues with batteries, the lithium is trying to recycle the things, which probably goes back to the plastics problem. It's very difficult to recycle batteries. So the types of batteries our researchers develop is focused on recycling, sustainability, um, things like that. Yeah. Thanks, David. Paul, for concluding. Okay. Thank you, thank you David. Uh, another wonderful presentation. I learned so much. So uh, lots of food for thought. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank yep. You. Round of applause, everybody. Very good. Um, now, next week's meeting is again on Zoom. Um, we will have our guest speaker will be Mike Kazam. He is a peace activist with the Australian Friends of Palestine Association. And the topic is working to promote a just peace for this Palestinian people. A very topical um, uh, talk, I'm sure. Uh, before we go, I would just like to mention one person who is with us today. We have Steve Morris with us. And Steve uh, is going to be our newest member very soon. And we're looking forward to inducting him on the 16th. So, uh, Steve, I saw your picture there. It's just gone to a different screen now. But uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk today. I'm, I'm sure you did. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming along on Zoom again. <laughs> Sorry, somebody's saying, was that Florian trying to say? Yep, Florian, you got a comment? We have a, on the 15th of February, Tuesday in two weeks, we have our first social evening of the year. It will be at Comfort Inn. And the main point I'm just mentioning it now is because we need for numbers, we need people to register by Thursday before, so Thursday the 10th of February. Um, so check the bulletin and the registration page on the website for the next social evening. Thanks, Florian. Okay, so we have to book for that one well in advance. Okay, everybody, it's one minute past two. Sorry we've gone over time. Um, thanks for your company today again, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a great week, everybody. Bye for now. Bye.